Hi everyone, welcome back. I'm Michael Sandler, your host on Inspire Nation. If you've ever wanted more happiness in your life, then do we have the Shortcuts to Happiness show for you. Today I'll be talking with Tal Ben-Shahar, former Harvard professor who taught the largest course at Harvard, positive psychology, and one of the leading happiness experts in the world. He's also the author of several fantastic books on happiness, including Choose the Life You Want, Happier, and his latest quatture, Shortcuts to Happiness. And that's just what I want to talk with him about today, about life-changing lessons he learned from his barber. But plus we'll talk about Eliov and curl curbing, Jacob's Grocer and Cafe Caramel, the danger of Sisyphus, the importance of granola cookies, Gnarls Barkley's Crazy, gotcha, The Wisest Man and Ramat Hasharon, Parking Cars and Cows, <laughs> And what in the world Avi's Occam's Razor has to do with anything. So welcome to the show, Tal. Are you ready to shine? Uh, thank you, Michael. Yes, I am. Woohoo! So I was going to ask you, and we've had you on several times, to give me a Tal Ben-Shahar 101. But instead, people can go back and reference our other shows. What I'm most curious about is, as one of the leading happiness experts in the world, what have you been either researching at present or has been most interesting to you? Well, actually, let me share with you something that I read this morning. Go for it. Um, so right now, I'm, uh, what I'm doing is I'm uh, creating a school curriculum for uh, K through 12, yep. um, where students each week will read a story or an excerpt. And, um, and we'll discuss it, and it will revolve around some aspect of happiness, whether it's uh, spirituality, whether it's about physical well-being, whether it's about finding purpose, uh, whether it's, uh, it's about dealing with painful emotions. So they'll read something, and then they'll discuss it in class. So I'm, I'm reading a lot over the last, uh, well, few months. And what I read this morning was uh, a short essay by Rene Descartes. Rene Descartes, considered by many the father of modern philosophy. And here's what he wrote. What he wrote was that um, where he learned the most was not from books, even though, though he was extremely learned. You know, he spoke uh, a number of languages, uh, you know, fluently, you know, read in Latin and, and Greek and uh, you know, spoke, uh, you know, uh, Dutch and, uh, and, and German and English, you name it. Um, and yet he said from all his readings, what he learned the most was from two sources. One, conversations with other people. And two, looking within. So rather than research, me search. And um, I found that fascinating. You know, one of the greatest philosophers in the world has written very influential texts, and yet he says, "Don't be wedded to uh, uh, to books. Don't fall into the traps of uh, of academia. Learn from people. Learn from yourself." I love that. So I'm glad we're having this conversation. I I am too, and it, it gets me thinking. I love our audience tremendously, but if I can actually help them to step back from the constant desire for information and pause or go within, the answers often reveal themselves, don't they? They do. And, and not only that, uh, we also learn about others through that. So I, I love uh, Maslow, Abraham Maslow's quote, who says, he who looks into the depth of his own mind has looked into the depth of all minds. In other words, we learn most about others by looking within. I love it. So let's talk more about others. When I go home to Massachusetts, which is, uh, I see my parents a, a few times, well, hopefully a few times a year. I'm going to see them in Florida in a couple of weeks. When I go home to Massachusetts, I go first and foremost to the local barber, Gene from Italy, who, um, he has my book on a shelf. He's got my picture off to the side and he treats, he's well into his 80. He treats every single person there as if they're his or her, his, his son or daughter and the greatest person in the world. What can you tell us about your barber? Mm. Actually, I must say, um, reminds me a bit of, uh, of Avi, my barber. So, um, I think the most important lesson that I that I learned from him was about relationships. Just what you relay about about Gene, because he really does treat people with respect. 
Now, what I did in this book was I, um, I, I wrote about his wisdom, whether um, something he said or something he did, and then I connected it to research or uh, some uh, philosophical reflection. And, um, and relationships is one of the topics that, 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 I, um, that, that I wrote about because Avi emphasizes relationships. So you walk in and just like with Gene, you're the most important person in the world. He insists on phones off, face to face, um, give you the, the, the attention that, that you deserve and you need. Now, the interesting thing is that when you look at research on relationships, you find that the happiest individuals in the world and the healthiest individuals in the world um, have uh, strong intimate relationships. This is research done uh, at Harvard, the famous relationship study, where they looked at um, um, Harvard graduates as well as community members, and they followed them for 75 years. So for most of them, it was for their entire lives. And... Um, they found that the best predictor of both health and happiness yeah. was the quality of your relationships. Now, interestingly, it didn't matter what relationship. So it could be uh, your relationships with your uh, partner, a romantic relationship. It could be extended family. It could be friends. Yeah. It could be uh, professional relationships. And it can be a relationship with your barber. I love it. From there, I'm going to go back into my childhood. I'm going to reveal something here. As a child... My mom wasn't very touchy-feely at all. Going to the barber, having a hand on my shoulder, a hand running through my hair, just or even just the comb going through my hair, was like that once-a-month boost <laughs> I needed to keep me going. What was going on there? Ah, you know, th th this is such a great point. You know, as a culture, in many ways, we have lost touch with touch. Mm -hmm. Um, so um, there's, uh, there's some great research by Tiffany Field. She's a professor at the University of Miami uh, on the importance of touch. And, and what she has shown, others in the field have shown, is that from literally from the minute we're born until the day we die, we have a craving and need, physiological and psychological need for touch. Um, and how... Why is it so important? Well, for, for babies, it's important for, for development, yeah. for both physiological development, putting on weight, as well as psychological development, the ability to connect to other people. Uh, as adults, um, touch is a uh, pain reliever. It helps us heal. It releases all those good chemicals in, in, our, in our bodies. It... Um, of course, contributes to our psychological well-being, to our happiness. And today, um, we have lost touch with, with touch. And a touch can be anything from a, you know, a great massage. Yeah. It can be hugs. There's some, uh, some fascinating work done by uh, Jane Clipman, where she got people, um, this was their assignment, to hug five extra times a day. I so this it. was the assignment. And um, those who did it, uh, both men and women, became significantly happier as a result. It wasn't easy for everyone, but, but it was their task. They had to do it. They were paid to, uh, to, to, to be part of this experiment, and, the, and, the, and they became happier for it. Um, you've got me thinking. First off, I had a guest on recently from England who said he was a good English chap. And so he goes, I promise people at my lectures, you won't have to hug the person next to you. <laughs> but then I'm thinking a book tour. Nine, ten years ago, I was given this device in the Philippines. It was like a head scratcher. You put it on your head and you go up and down and it gets all the sides of your head. And I realized I had a similarity. I don't know if you've, if you've seen the, mov the movie on her life of Temple Grandin. Um, which is is a a famous professor at CSU who has uh, who's well on the autism spectrum, and mm. she's developed a means for herding cattle, for instance, just one of many things, a very humane way of herding cattle to the slaughterhouse where they're not going to panic. And what she discovered with herself is putting herself in some sort of a cattle device that holds her on both sides would calm and soothe the nervous mm. system. And I found that head scratcher, it might be going back to childhood. If I'm completely wound up and my wife catches me from behind without me knowing and hits me the, with the head scratcher, all of a sudden I go from fight or flight to the parasympathetic nervous system. Yes. 
Yeah, it's exactly right. And, you know, it's something which is so basic, so primal. Um, and, uh, and it's a need to be, you know, hugged by, by a parent um, or to, to be hugged by a partner. Again, this is a need that doesn't go away. It's obviously, um, um, it, uh, it may be more necessary as, as children and as adults, maybe we can live without it, but we can't live well without it. Thank you. Since we're talking about children, I want to go a few different directions with this. First off, potential benefit for children of hardship. Mm. Yes. Yeah, so, um, you know, Maria Montessori, the great educator, once said, uh, do not do for a child what the child can do for him or herself. And, you know, if the child can uh, tie their shoelaces by themselves, even if it takes them long and even if they struggle, let, let them do it. You know, unless you're in a hurry and you need to get to work in the morning and then fine, you do it for them. But whenever possible, um, let, let them struggle. Now, this doesn't just apply to, to shoes. It also, uh, it also applies to difficulties they're having in school. So, yes, of course, you're there to protect them. Uh, however, if they're struggling in school, whether it's socially, whether it's with a particular teacher, if possible, let them um, uh, experience it themselves. Let them solve the issue themselves. You know, if I if I fast forward, uh, you know, my, my field, original field at least, is organizational behavior. Yeah. And um, and um, if you look at leadership, organizational leadership, the best leaders today are ones who struggled yesterday. There are the ones who made mistakes. There are the ones, and, and, and when I say yesterday, I don't just mean um, when they were at work. I also mean yesteryears, mm -hmm. when, they were, when they were in school and, and they struggled and they had to solve it themselves. And if you think about it, the analogy is simple. You go to the gym and, and, and you pick the lightest weights and you just you know lift them like this. You're not going to benefit from it. You're going to get stronger, more resilient from struggle. You're going to get stronger when it, when it is hard. I like that you brought up the word resilience because you know exactly where I'm going to go right now with Carol DeWick. Mindset, because this is something we think, oh, we must protect a child's self-esteem, tell them they're smart, tell them they're good at something. But the studies are showing otherwise, aren't they? Yes. Um, so, you know, what Carol Dweck has shown is showing, whether it's with children, whether it's with adults, we don't want to praise them for those things that they actually have no control over. So when, you know, when I tell my, when I tell my child, you're smart, what, what, what can she do with it? There's one thing that she can do with it. And that is protect yeah. that perception. In other words, not appear that she's not smart. In other words, she's now not going to try things that where she may fail. Mm -hmm. She's not going to struggle. She's going to go the easiest, uh, choose the easiest route. And that's unfortunate because the easiest route is not the route where you learn the most, where you strengthen the most, where you grow the most. It's rather when we praise, we should praise children, absolutely, but praise them for the path, uh, for the journey, for the hard work, for the effort. And when I praise them for the effort, this is something that they can work with. Yeah. And, and I love praising them for their ability to overcome. You may not be the smartest, who knows, but I know that you can find a way. You're really good at that. Exactly right. So if we can um, if we can focus on the journey, two things will happen. First of all, they're going to continue journeying. They're they're going to continue struggling. They're going to continue improving. And uh, second, they're going to be much happier for it uh, because um, you know trying and falling down. You know, you, you, you look look at a kid when they when they learn how to walk. You know they fall down. Yeah, they may cry if it hurts, but a minute later they're laughing again and and they're up and running or trying to run again. Um, and this is what life can be like. Mihaly Csikszentmihalyi, who speaks, uh, who writes and 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 researches the concept flow. Yes. Um, talks about how education uh, needs to once again become an adventure. Learning how to walk for a child is an adventure. Why can't education in general be that way? So. That radically changes somebody's, but because I see so many people in my coaching practice that are terrified of failure or terrified of stepping out there because they were taught you had to follow the mold and go for the grade. Yes, um, we have we have it on. You know, the the, the, the we have our values. Um, um, we have our priorities wrong. You know, the priority. You know. If a child gets a top grade or not, 
it actually doesn't it actually doesn't matter in in the long term if they get into this college versus that college it actually doesn't matter in in the long term um that is if we're concerned with their happiness you know if happiness was about success then uh, all uh, ivy league graduates top university graduates would be would be happy they're not uh, in fact we see a lot of depression a lot of anxiety an increasing number of suicides among the very successful um look at the 27 club and uh and and you know these people who have really made it and in fact you know this is something that i've been thinking about for for, for a long time and we're seeing it manifested uh, even more so over the last couple of years and that is what happens to those people who make it big you know to the really successful ones and why do we see so much unhappiness so much drugs so much um alcohol alcoholism uh, so many suicides when we get to um um, among people who are ultra successful. And here is the reason. You see, what we're told throughout our lives, whether it's by, um, by our parents or teachers or just, you know, in the ether as part of our, you know, cultural conventional wisdom, we're told that the path to happiness is through success. You become successful, then you'll be happy. You may not be happy now in school, but if you get into the next school, which is even more prestigious, then you'll be happy. You may not be happy now, but when you get into your top college, then you'll be happy or you'll get, um, you know, this top job or or uh, make this kind of money and so on and so on. That's what we're told. Now, take that person who's really made it. They're not happy maybe as children, as teenagers, as young adults, and then they make it. Then they become a famous rock star or movie star or athlete or whatever it is. And suddenly they have it all. Suddenly they have um, more money than they know what to do with. Suddenly they are that um, um, they, they can get any man or woman uh, they want. They're revered. They're admired. So they make it. And initially they're ecstatic. It feels great. But then what happens a month later or a year later? They go right back to where they were before, as happy or unhappy as they were before. Because success doesn't lead to happiness. It leads to a short spike in well-being, but, but short spike, temporary, ephemeral. It makes me think, particularly if you have, quote, made it, and then you don't find yourself happy, now you're going to turn the mirror on yourself, hopefully in a good way. But usually my guess is what happens is you go, exactly. what the hell is wrong with me? How can I not be happy now? Exactly. Because until that point, they, they would say to themselves, well, when I make it, then I'll be happy. But they make it there. And suddenly they realize that there is no there there. And now not only are they unhappy as they were before, they now don't have the hope that they will be happy in the future. You see, the difference between sadness and depression mm -hmm. is that depression is sadness without hope. So they're hopeless, and, and that's when they become depressed. And then they look for the answers, not in the world, because the world hasn't supplied them the solution. They look for it outside. What does it mean outside? Outside means in... Uh, in, in drugs or alcohol or the ultimate escape from reality, suicide. Thank you. Let's go from there. Actually, we're going to stay on this topic for a minute. You said people are looking for success to find happiness, and maybe it's the reverse. And, and I want to think, I think of money as an amplifier. Maybe you can, you can uh, speak to any literature on this, that if you're happy before, before you have money, you may be happy afterwards or happier. If you don't before, you may be more miserable ap afterwards because it's not success to happiness, it's happiness to success. Yes, uh, ex exactly right. And the thing is that um, people who realize the, the real nature, not the illusion, the real nature of happiness can actually use money to become happier. Um, two things in particular. Yeah. There's a lot of research on the relationship between money and happiness, and generally what the research shows is, is quite simple. Yes, if you have no money and you need money for basic needs, of course it will contribute to your happiness. You know, have food on the table, not be under stress in terms of feeding your family. Yes. However, beyond basic needs, food, shelter, additional money doesn't make us happier. This is generally the, the research. There are exceptions. We know or let me, let, me, let me start by, you know, when they ask people, what do you think will make you happier? Buying something with extra money or experiencing something? Yeah. 
Uh, so, for example, you know, buying a, a new car or a bigger house or going on a vacation with your, uh, with your family or, or friends. Most people would say buying something. Why? Because a vacation is over in a week or two. Buying something that will be with me five years from now, it will last much longer. Not so. In the long term, experiences contribute much more to happiness than things. So that's one very important finding about happiness. Spend your discretionary income, if you have extra money, on experiences. And the thing is, it doesn't have to be ex expensive. Going to a local um, uh, restaurant or eating at a food court or just hanging out, having an experience with friends, that contributes to happiness much more than that extra thing. Um, the second thing, interesting thing about money is um, that giving is receiving. So when we donate, when we help uh, others with our money, that actually contributes to our overall happiness more so than if we use that money for buying something extra for ourselves. There are so studies help. on this, aren't there? There are some fascinating studies. So um, let, let, let me share one, one of them. So this, is, um, this was done a joint uh, venture between the University of British Columbia and Harvard Business School. And what they did was they brought in a group of people and gave them a nice sum of money. Before that though, they measured their levels of happiness. So they measure their level of happiness and they give them a nice sum of money. And then they tell them, go uh, spend this money yeah. on yourself. Go get yourself something. And they did and they bought themselves a gadget or they bought themselves shoes or whatever. They come back to the lab. They measure their levels of happiness. What do they find? Happiness levels go up significantly. Yeah. This is important research. This is the first time in recorded history when there is scientific evidence for Carrie Bradshaw's claim from Sex and the City that buying shoes makes you happier. I love it. She was right. But then they, they measure their levels of happiness again the following day. What do they find? It goes back to where it was before. Again, the spike, temporary. Second group of, so, so what, what, what does this mean? It means we need to buy shoes every day, right? If, if we are to maintain this or not, or not. Second group of people come into the lab, measure their levels of happiness again, um, give them the exact same amount of money, and then tell them, go spend this money on someone else. So go buy someone something, donate it to your favorite charity, buy meals for a homeless person, whatever it is that you do with it, go spend it on someone else. They go back to the lab. They measure their levels of happiness. It goes up to the same degree as buying shoes or, or something else with one very important difference. The following day when they come back to the lab, they measure their levels of happiness. It goes down a little bit, but it's still significantly higher than base level. After a week, they still found the impact, personal benefit of giving to others. What does this also have to do? I'm, I'm thinking of, of vacations and experiences, and I'm thinking of this as we now have a story inside of us, a story we can share with others, a story we can play to ourselves, and whether we might get a, a beautiful hit of happiness each time we play the story again. Exactly. So, so the, the permanent aspect of a vacation, obviously a vacation is over within a week or two, but the permanent aspects of it are, first of all, as you mentioned, we have a story, we talk about these things. Second, and this is a very important uh, idea to keep in mind regarding interventions mm -hmm. when it, uh, regarding happiness. What we're doing is we're starting an upward spiral. So, you know, we go on vacation together and we get to know one another a little bit better. We have shared memories. Now we're more likely to meet one another in most cases um, after the vacation because we had that uh, vacation together. And, and, and that builds something. And then we build on that something and so on and so on in an upward spiral. You know, for the same reason that people very often ask me, you know, how is it? that the research on gratitude shows such radical uh, results. You know, people who, who, who write down things for which they're grateful, you know, one to two minutes a day or even once a week mm -hmm. uh, are happier, healthier, more optimistic, more successful, and physically healthier because of one to two minutes a day or five minutes a week. Why? And the answer is because it may just be one or two minutes, but those one or two minutes start an upward spiral. Because after I focus on what's positive in my life, 
I'm more likely to look for positive things. And therefore, I'm more likely to find positive things, not just during those one or two minutes, but the following day. And, um, and if I persist with it for my entire life, small changes make a big difference. Beautiful. Let's talk about another small upward change. What's the research show about posture? Ah, uh, you know, so um, remember when the teacher used to tell you in school or, or someone else, sit up straight. Yes. And, uh, and, you know, then everyone, you know, would, would do that. Well, it turns out that that is, uh, is good for a few things. It's good for concentration. Yes, you're, you're more focused on what the teacher is saying when you sit like this than when you sit like this. Yeah. And it does something else. It actually makes you feel better about yourself. It makes you actually happier. Why? There is um, a, a wonderful um, theory uh, which was backed by a lot of research developed by Daryl Bem yeah. uh, from Cornell University, Bem, B-E-M. And um, what he named it was self-perception theory. How do we perceive ourselves? And here is basically the, the, the idea. Yeah. When I look at other people, I derive conclusions about them based on what I see. Mm -hmm. So, for example, if I see a person uh, hitting another person, I'm going to say, you know, this is not a friendly, nice, kind person. If I see uh, a person giving and helping other people, my conclusion about that person is, oh, must be a nice, kind person. Similarly, with postures, if I see a person, you know, coming into a room like this with the shoulders stooped and uh, um, and looking like they lack confidence. My conclusion about them is, oh, they, they're not confident. Whereas if I see someone coming into a room, standing up straight, you know, with a smile, perhaps looking confident. <laughs> yes, exactly. That power pose. I like it. Um, then, then my conclusions about that person will be, oh, that person is confident, strong. Now, self-perception theory, Daryl Bem's idea is that we derive conclusions about ourselves in the same way we derive conclusions about others. Meaning if we see ourselves, so to speak, perceive ourselves sitting like this, oh, no confidence. Like this, oh, confidence. And in that respect, we're sending messages. Our physiology is sending message to our psychology. And we actually become more confident if we sit confidently. Um, we actually feel better if we smile. You know, a smile, a, a genuine smile, releases certain chemicals in our brain, in our throughout our body that make us feel better, happier. It's it's going to sound kind of weird. Another admission here. Years ago, and I actually I still practice it, but I don't need to do it for that reason. But years ago, I had been jilted in a few relationships. I found myself not smiling. It was kind of like this scar, this wound I was wearing on my face. And I had had a major, amazing, um, read an amazing book by Patrick McKeown, uh, The Oxygen Advantage, uh, talking about the Buteyko method of breathing and how if you put a piece of tape over your mouth at night, it can help you sleep better, get you into the parasympathetic nervous system, and help calm you throughout the day. I started practicing that and I realized, well, if I taped myself in a smile, <laughs> I was more likely to find myself still smiling in the morning. And because I was still smiling, I actually felt better. Right. Yeah, it's interesting. You know, there is research which has become a little bit con uh, controversial in terms of the results, but um, uh, some of the results uh, still hold true, which is getting people to um, hold a pen or a pencil mm -hmm. like this. Now, when we do that, wonderful. <laughs> okay. So when you do that, I have to take it out because I have to talk. Yes, yes, oh, well, yes. I don't. So when you do that, what happens is that um, you're, you're naturally smiling. Yeah. And people actually feel better. They become more positive when they do that, that versus another group that held the pencil like this. Forward, yes. You're not smiling when you do this, and you are when, when you do that. So, again, small changes make a big difference. Now, is this the... The answer, the solution to a, to a happier, better life? No, it, ta it takes more than that often. However, once again, it's these small changes that over time can make a big difference. Let's because if you go into a conversation, you know, with a smile, that will not just affect that minute when you're smiling. It could lead to an upward spiral. And it's contagious, too. And people think you are safe and warm and they want to come over and engage you in a 
friendly upwards bio conversation. Exactly right. So let's talk about the reverse of that. There is this trend today, it's a little bit scary, which is particularly online, people being not so happy to each other. What does this do? You come into work and you're looking for um you're looking for validation by going, oh my God, you wouldn't believe this person in front of me. You wouldn't believe this other thing, this other person did this, did that. What's happening when we're putting each other down? Yeah. You know, the, the, the thing that's happening is that um, we're obviously making other people um, less happy. No less importantly, we're also making ourselves less happy. You know, just like giving um, contributes to both sides, uh, giving doesn't just need to be uh, uh, something, something physical, something material. Giving can very much be spiritual um, and frank. Um, wrote in her journal when she was 14 years old. Um, she was, uh, you know, a, a young girl growing up in uh, in Nazi Germany. She was Jewish, hiding from the Nazis in her home. Um, and um, at 14, she wrote this. She said, "You can always, always give something, even if it is only kindness." And um, and again, the benefit is to to both sides. You know, one of the exercises that my mom um, um, used to have us do when we were we were kids is she would say, you know, take 15 minutes now to be extra kind, not, you know, 150 minutes, not uh, 15 days, 15 minutes to be extra kind. She said, I know you're 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 a kind person. Be extra kind. Now, the impact that 15 minutes of kindness can have are not just for those 15 minutes and they're not just for yourself. They trickle on in time and they trickle on in space and through that kindness we're, we're impacting our our own happiness as well as as well as others and if we come into work in the morning and say just 15 minutes of kindness let me start the day this way you'd be surprised pleasantly surprised just how much of an impact that can have on the work environment not just yourself, the whole environment. I love it. Since we're talking about kindness, my mind always goes to Kristen Neff. And maybe you can tell us about being extra kind to ourselves. ourselves. Absolutely. So, you know, there's a lot of talk, especially in, uh, in, in the U.S., about, uh, um, about self-esteem and, and self-reliance, you know, and, 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 and believing in yourself. And that is, of course, important. Um, however, there has been little talk until recently, about self-compassion. And, um, you know, Neff talks about it, about being more forgiving to ourselves. Uh, Brene Brown talks about it in terms of being uh, a more, more forgiving, more compassionate to ourselves. And it reminds me, you know, the, the Dalai Lama, um, when he first came to, uh, to the West, yeah. he, he, was, he, he was shocked by, well, by, by many things, but, but one thing in particular and that is the fact that so many people in the West have low self-esteem. And he didn't make sense to him. He said, this is a phenomenon that we don't encounter in, uh, in Tibet or in India, where he was spending most of his time. And, um, and then he pointed out something which, which is interesting. He said, the word uh, compassion in, in Tibetan is the word tsewe. And tsewe, he says, means compassion for others and compassion for self and he said there are two sides of the same coin and in fact you need to start with compassion for self because if you have no compassion for self how can you really cultivate healthy compassion for others now in the west when we talk about compassion we immediately um skip to the second stage compassion for others we forget step number one compassion for self um our cultural roots um actually point to having compassion for self. Think about the, the golden rule, which is, by the way, common to East and West, to Confucius and to, uh, uh, and to the, both the Old and the New Testament. Compassion towards self. Love your neighbor as you love yourself. Yes, love your neighbor, but hey, you're starting with yourself because if you don't love yourself, you don't have a standard by which to love your neighbor. So once again, tsewe, compassion, compassion, uh, loving ourselves as a precondition for the love of others. 
So I'm so glad you mentioned that. I had a dog who I, I named, I pronounced it Sawa, and, and I named her this years ago, and I had forgotten the exact meaning. So wow. I'm so, and, and, and she was my service dog for almost 17 years, and definitely compassion. Going back to the Dalai Lama story, what I found fascinating when he wrote his first book after he came here is that in the West, not only do we pick on ourselves, but we'll read something, for, something self-help oriented on how we can become more compassionate for ourselves. We turn the mirror on ourselves, realize we're not being compassionate on ourselves, and then we get down on ourselves. How do we break that cycle? Yeah, I mean, this is exactly the point. How do we break this uh, the cycle? You know, you know, there is a, there's a sentence. I don't I don't know the the, the source of this sentence that um, um, pain is inevitable, suffering is optional. Now, what what this sentence means, and specifically from an Eastern perspective, is that you know life is uh, life is painful. I mean, there are there are difficult experiences in life. We go through struggles. You know, we talk about it as children. We go through it as adults. You know, we're in a relationship. We're, we're parents. We're working. There's a lot, there are a lot of difficulties. There's a lot of hardship in life. That's inevitable. However, the second level of pain, the second level of suffering is not accepting and embracing the first level. Because if I say to you, okay, so I'm, I'm struggling now. It's hard for me. And that's fine. Part of being alive, part of being human, I accept it. In contrast, if I say to myself, how is it that I'm experiencing this, this pain? I have so much to be, to be grateful for. Why am I struggling, suffering? Why, why am I experiencing this pain? I'm adding a second level of pain to the inevitable pain. That second level is a choice. Now, if I choose self-compassion, if I choose in the words of Tara Brock, radical acceptance mm -hmm. of whatever it is that I'm experiencing. If I accept that, then there is one level of suffering and that goes away just as it came. This is the temporary nature of, of all emotions. But I, I um, embed it, I reinforce it when I reject it. And that's when I add the second level of suffering. Thank you. So going along those lines, there's, there's a word that I'm trying to strike entirely from my vocabulary, and it has to do with regret. Should mm. have. What can you tell us about regret and radical acceptance? Mm. So, so here is the thing. There, there's actually some very interesting research on, uh, on regret, uh, which unfortunately has not uh, entered uh, um, conventional wisdom yet, because I, I think it can help. I mean, it certainly helped me. Um, so there is a distinction between two forms of regret, regret of omission and regret of commission. Mm. So regret of omission is not doing something and I wish I had done it or I wish I had tried. Regret, regret of commission is I did something and I wish I hadn't done it. Now, there's an interesting outcome to both forms of, of regret. Initially, initially we the regret of um commission meaning i did something i shouldn't have done it mm -hmm. exacts a higher emotional price from from us in other words it's more painful than regrets of omission something that i didn't do however that's just in the short term in the long term when it comes to regret of commission we stop regretting it after a short period of time. It goes away. Whereas regret of omission, I should have done it. Very often people stay with it for years. So this is one interesting line of research. Um, in other words, try, even if you fail and you regret it later, try. Is it that the mind goes wild with possibilities? The mind is continuous. What would have happened if only I had? Exactly. What, what Daniel Kahneman calls the counterfactuals. What if? So, so, so this is one area. Remember, it's better to try and fail than not to try and regret. Having said that, even if you do regret, don't fight the regret. Accept the fact that, yes, you know, maybe I should have, maybe I could have, I wish I did. I'm human. I made the best decision at that point, given what I had. 
So let's segue from best decision to what is the happiest way to make decisions. The happiest way to make decision, actually, it's it's to be happy while you're doing it. I mean, this is this is fun research. Uh, Alice Eisen, she yeah. did this research where um, she got both, she made kids as well as adults happier mm-hmm. by doing simple things like you know giving kids a, a candy or telling a joke to to the adults, and when they were happier, when their mood was more positive, they. Um, They actually made better decisions. And this goes all the way to doctors who had to diagnose an an illness. They made better decisions about their their patient when they were in a positive mood. Um, So, so again, success doesn't lead to happiness. Happiness leads to, uh, to success. Thank you. What can you tell us about Professor Joseph Badaracco and making right versus right decisions? Wow. Okay. So, um, Professor Badaraka was my my teacher yeah. in uh, um, when I was a graduate student. He teaches uh, still today at Harvard Business School, and uh, a very soft spoken, uh, unassuming man with uh, with an all consuming mind. And his basic idea is the following: He talks about business ethics and, and decision making, ethical decision making, and he says, "Look, decisions between." Uh, uh, right and wrong are easy. Should I be? Should I lie or should I be honest? You know, easy decision. Should I be kind or should I be uh, unkind? Easy decision. Um, should I be ethical or immoral? Easy decision. He says the difficult decisions at work and in life are not the right versus wrong decisions. They are the right versus right decisions. And. He gives uh, you know many examples at, at, in, in the workplace, for instance. You know your your organization is going through a very difficult uh, time. Um, there is even a threat of bankruptcy uh, down the line. Do you um, do you fire people? Do you lay off people, uh, knowing that it's right to keep people with you, especially if you know they've been with you for a long time. They're loyal. You want to be loyal to them. At the same time, it's also right to save the business. And it may be necessary to lay off people to save the business. Right versus right decision. Or very often politicians, not very often, but once in a while politicians have to make right versus right decisions. Um, Do we go to war? Is it a just war? You know, going to war inevitably uh, uh, um, takes uh, takes lives and innocent people will die. No war has uh, has, has, has been able to circumvent that. Um, at the same time, sometimes not going to war exacts an even higher price in the long term, right versus right decision. Um, all the most difficult decisions that we have to make are right versus right decisions. I mean, think about pro-life, pro-choice. Um, does a woman have a right to her body? Absolutely. Um, do you, is there a right for, you know, whether it's a, a person or not a person, depends which side you're on, to, to become whole, to lead a full and fulfilling life. Absolutely, it's a right versus right decision. Uh, this is why it's so difficult. This is why we argue about it uh, uh, so much. And the important thing about right versus right decisions is, first of all, to understand the other side. This is not an easy decision for anyone to make. This is not a no-brainer, regardless of which side you're on. One. Uh, two, when we decide, these are defining moments. These are the defining moments of politicians. Mm-hmm. These are the defining moments of individuals when you make right versus right decisions. They're not easy. And what we need to do, and this takes me to another um, a, a topic that I talk about uh, in, in the book, we need to be in silence. We need to reflect. We need to give ourselves time. We need to um, allow nature to take its course. And by nature, I mean our thinking and our feeling to take their course before we decide. We may not decide um, uh, correctly. We may regret it later, but we need to give ourselves the, the, the chance to at least think rightly when we make right versus right decision. It'd be really cool if we remember to bookmark. You make a right versus right decision. And you have taken the time, as, as, as your, your, your barber talks about, there's a time to go fast and there's a time to go slow and sit on the fence. 
when you sit on the fence to make the decision or to know time's up, any decision gets to be made now, to make a bookmark or a giant stamp and go ka-dunk, maybe actually NLP, make a sound and say, I will remember for always, I took the time and did the best I could so that we don't come back on ourselves. Uh, yes, again, exactly. You made the best decision given what you had at the moment. So let's go from there. Let's talk briefly about anger management, cows, parking spots, and SUVs. Good. So, um, so, so I was having my hair cut. You know, by the way, during the time when I was writing uh, this book, my hair was very short because I had <laughs> many haircuts. Any excuse to just go to him and, and you know, hear what he has to say. And I didn't want him to be suspicious that I was writing a book about him because he didn't know. So, um, so I was having a, a, a haircut and um, suddenly this, um, this uh, you know, woman comes in and she's all, you know, angry and upset because, you know, someone cut her off. And, uh, and, uh, and, and then Avi, in his wisdom, said, look, this is what I do when someone cuts me off. He says, imagine, you know, you're, 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 you're waiting for this parking spot to open. And finally, the car comes out. And as, as you're about to go in, an SUV comes and, boom, cuts you off and parks in your spot. Um, what do you do? Well, one thing to do is you can pick a fight and, uh, you know, get really angry. Be right. Uh, the other thing that you can do is be smart. And he says, what I do when I'm cut off by an SUV, I imagine that a cow has just cut me off. Now, as soon as he said, I imagine a cow cut me off, you know, we, we laughed. And he said, exactly. Because that's when you change your uh, mood from being angry, um, from looking at it from an anger perspective, looking at it from a humorous perspective. Because if a cow cuts you off, you're not going to get upset at the cow. And, um, and you know, there's a lot of wisdom in what he said. There is a lot of research on, on the following. The fact that we cannot experience two contradictory emotions at the same time. In other words, we cannot experience anger and amusement at the same time. We can't experience uh, hatred and empathy at the same time. So why not replace those unwanted or what Buddhists would call those destructive emotions? Why not replace them with the, the, the generous, the, the pleasurable, joyful emotions? And this is what Avi does and taught me. I've been doing it since. Um, imagine a cow instead of an SUV just cut you off. I had a, a uh, not even a fender bender. We, we kissed me and a cow, also known as a oversized Ford pickup truck in a parking lot. <laughs> a big cow. A big cow. And my first goal is, everybody okay? Is, is the driver of the other vehicle okay? How can I bring more love and compassion? And we ended up ending this exchange with hugs. Wow. Bringing us full circle. When we talk about hurt management, what did that do for us? Right. Yeah. So, so you know, it's... Um... So th this is the, po the, the, the point here. When you ask that question, how can I help? Is he okay? Are they okay? Then you immediately changed from, um, from potential anger to empathy. You can't have them, uh, you can't have them at, the, uh, at the same time. Beautiful. Um, so the... Um, the thing about hurt management, and this is something that, that, that Avi talks about, um, if someone hurts us, there are, again, few paths that we can take. One path that we can take is hurt them back. And by the way, this is the instinctive um, automatic reaction. In fact, they did even research on animals. If you have two animals next to one another and you hurt one animal, you shock them. And the shock comes from another source the initial reaction of that animal is to hurt that animal next to it, to bite it. Um, so this is something which is, um, which is, you know, innate, instinctive in us. We're hurt, we want to hurt back. Um, it's possible to choose otherwise. And the, the way uh, Avi, my barber, does it is whenever someone hurts him, he always thinks automatically, and by now it's instinctive because he's been practicing it, how 
they are hurt because they're hurting him because they are hurt. And immediately when I think of someone else being hurt, what's the immediate emotion that comes up? Compassion, empathy. And then instead of hurting them back and then creating this downward spiral of hurt, 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 I introduce compassion and I break that cycle right there where compassion leads to compassion and on and on in an upward spiral. Awesome. Let's talk about another upward spiral here. A compliment. For instance, Tal, this is an awesome discussion here today. <laughs> you know, uh, Mark Twain once said, uh, I can live with a good compliment for two months. So, Michael, I'm off. I'm happy for two months. Thank you for the compliment. <laughs> <Woo -hoo>! uh, <laughs> and yet, and yet, we shouldn't wait uh, two months. What we should do is um, realize the power uh, of compliments, because remember, when we give, we also receive the power of compliments to the person receiving it and the power of compliment to us uh, giving it. And imagine, imagine this. If I give, if I decide, just, you know, what I said earlier about my mom, be kind for 15 minutes, extra kind for 15 minutes a day. What if I decide to dispense with three extra compliments a day? Now, people who are complimented are more likely to compliment others. Imagine the impact that these three compliments um, carried out consistently daily, the impact that it can have not just on yourself, on your environment and beyond. Awesome. Let's go from there. Let's talk about British psychologist Richard Wiseman. Why are some people considered to be lucky? Yeah, so I love Richard Wiseman's uh, research. He is indeed a wise man. Yes. And um, I love and, his and name. What he, <laughs> and what he... Um, uh, what he did, his research on is on luck and to show is luck really just luck or is there some way of actually becoming uh, lucky or doing something that can contribute to our luck. And he found that, yeah, some luck is just luck. You were in the right place at the right time. However, there are also characteristics to lucky people. One of the characteristics is that uh, they're always learning, always asking questions. They're open minded. And then they're more likely to find lucky breaks, so to speak. The, the other thing is that they interpret the reality positively. For instance, generally lucky people, let's say a lucky person uh, broke their, their arm. Very often they would say something like that, oh, I'm so lucky because I could have fallen on my head. Or there was research on, um, on people whose homes were burnt. And they're, the lucky ones would always find a silver lining. They would say, but we're safe. There was no, you know, no, no one got hurt. Or I was able to save this um, uh, family album, which is so dear to me. Um, so they would always find something positive. And people who look for the positive actually end up luckier in, in the long term. So open-mindedness and, and uh, a positive interpretation of life contributes to luck. Woohoo! <laughs> going back to, to Avi and going back to, to every lesson throughout this book and a lot of what we've talked about today, what's the importance of paying it forward? Yeah, so, you know, so I mentioned earlier about the, the, the idea of, of giving. Uh, when we give, we receive. And, and there is so much more. The best way to learn is to teach. In other words, you know, I always tell my students this, you know, if you hear something interesting, whether it's part of the course you're taking with me or, you, you know, you watched, uh, um, you know, Michael's uh, um, podcast and you learned something new, share it, share it with others, pay it forward. You're making the world a better place. You're making your life happier. So that leads to a perfect segue. Where can people go to find out more to find your beautiful book so they can get it and share it with others and your certificate program in happiness studies. Oh, thank you. So this is, this is something uh, which I just uh, started recently, um, a certificate uh, program in happiness studies. It's the first one of its kind uh, in the world. I hope not for long because I hope this will become a, a topic that many teach and, and even more learn. Um, and um, to get more information about this one year long certificate program, as well as um, my, my work with Avi, the barber, and, and, and other things, my website is uh, talbenshahar.com. Fantastic. And if you didn't catch talbenshahar.com, 
Come how on over to not? How could you not? Come on over to inspirenationshow.com and we'll make sure you get over to, I'll even spell it, T A L B E N S H A H A R.com as well. Done. well. <laughs> Few last questions for you, Tal. First off, I want to give people a homework assignment today to take action, a shortcut to happiness. What would you recommend? Um, first of all, take an hour to spend hour a week, or if you can, two hours a week, to spend with your nears and dears. Switch your phone off when you're doing it, switch all technology off, just be present to them, with them. Second, once a week, express gratitude, whether it's in writing or whether it's with friends. Third, move. After you have listened to this, just get up and move, and three times a week, exercise. It's good for you, for your mind and for your body. Beautiful. I have, because of the way the day is, is scheduled out for me, I have a set of rollers. It's a thing you put your bicycle on and you balance on these drums and pedal. Right in the other room set up, I go from finishing this, bounce onto that to make sure I have energy flowing circulation before what comes next. We talked early a lot about kids. What advice, Jessica wouldn't want me to leave without this question asked, what advice would you give parents to help their kids with happiness today? Yeah. Um, first of all, as much as possible, let them struggle. Let them deal with their own hardships and difficulties. Second, as we've talked about before, uh, compliment the, des the journey, not the destination, their hard work, their effort, not how smart or how beautiful uh, they are. And finally, most importantly, just once in a while, take a minute or two, whether it's before you interact with them or while you're interacting with them, to remind yourself that they are the most important or one of the most important parts of your life. Connect to them so that you can show them the love that you really feel towards them. Woohoo! <laughs> what personally, Tal, brings you the greatest happiness or what I call the Woohoo! The woohoo. Yes. Um, so, you know, Aristotle, and this is another one of the chapters in, in, in Avi's book, because he talked about it. Aristotle talked about two main sources of happiness. Yeah. Friendship and contemplation. In other words, relationships and thinking. Um, my relationships bring me the most happiness. And uh, writing, conversing, talking about ideas brings me the most happiness. Awesome. You know, I was going to ask you, Tal, any last words of wisdom. Maybe I still will, but what's a V mean to you? What he means to me is, uh, first, before everything, friendship. And the second thing, also related to what I just said, he, he, he means to me the presence of wisdom uh, wherever we are prepared to look and listen. Awesome. So on that note, then, any last words of wisdom you'd like to share today, Tal? Yes. Um, listen. Listen to what people have to say. Listen to the words uh, in a book. Listen to your children and listen to yourself. Woohoo! <laughs> Thank you so, so much, Tal. This has been so much fun. I had no idea. It's a beautiful book, but I had no idea exactly where we would go today. And this was phenomenal. Thank you very much, Michael. And thank you for, for all that you do, bringing happiness to our world. Thank you, thank you, thank you, and you as well. So for everyone out there, this is Michael Sandler saying, be well, have fun, get shortcuts to happiness, and begin shortcutting your way to happiness today and shine bright. Woohoo! That was awesome. Thank you, thank you, Michael. Thanks so much for watching. If you enjoyed it, be sure to like, like below. Also, leave your comments. Have some real fun with it. Subscribe to our channel where you're going to get more great videos, more interviews coming up. And check out our website, inspirenationshow.com. That's where you'll find tips, blogs, information, videos you won't find anywhere else, and useful and helpful resources to really help you kickstart your life and to shine bright. Thanks so much again. Thank you for your support. Like, 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 comment, subscribe. See the website. Thanks so much and have fun. Of course, shine bright. Woohoo! <laughs>